All right, yeah, let, let's start. And uh, guys, thanks for joining us. There are maybe a couple of people online and a few people here. And uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, so we have we, here with us uh, Jean Peidy. Hopefully I'm not watching too much. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, yeah, Jean is a research fellow at the uh, area Paris, 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 Paris. <laughs> as you want to pronounce it, uh, English, French. And uh, so I'm very excited about this talk, you would say. So there's not something that would be interesting a lot, uh, which is the geometric data analysis. And there is a lot of interesting stuff that can be done for, for data science, intersection of data science, mathematics, and uh, let's say artificial intelligence and machine learning. So so yes, uh, thanks, Jan, and very much looking forward to your talk. OK, thank you. So you, you can hear me well, right? Yes. Okay, perfect. So okay. thank you very much to all of you for being here and for to Grégoire for uh, the invitation uh, to your seminar. So as we talked a little bit before you arrived, so uh, I'm Jean and today, uh, you know, I work at INRIA Paris, which is like INRIA is the main French uh, research institute for AI with centers in the biggest, largest French cities, uh, Paris among them. Okay, and so as a quick, you know, background check so that you know who is talking to you, even though I cannot be uh, with you, unfortunately. So who am I? So basically, I, during my study, I majored in mathematics. So started doing a lot of mathematics and progressively, basically from 2015 onwards, I decided to go uh, more and more towards uh, clinical research, uh, uh, working with doctors, because I had strong like personal motivation to do that. So first I did my PhD thesis in medical imaging, uh, like brain registration, these kind of things. Then during the COVID years, uh, I was doing postdoc in London at Imperial College on geometric deep learning, working mostly on 3D data like uh, proteins, uh, protein docking, uh, and lung, uh, the registration of like lung 3D images. And then uh, since December, 2021, uh, I'm like tenured researcher, full-time researcher at INRIA Paris in the HECA team, which is uh, like one third people like you and I, like mathematicians uh, or computer scientists, one third statisticians like experts, you know, on clinical trials uh, and one third uh, real doctors like uh, who see uh, people, <laughs> who treat people, pharmacologists, these kind of things. So. I mean, for now, forever now, for seven years, I've had close ties with healthcare. So first medical imaging, then a subfield of medical imaging, which is computational anatomy. So the study of 3D shapes, uh, hearts, lungs, these kind of things. And then since my arrival at uh, INRIA, I'm learning more and more about public health, like analyzing drug consumption data that we have in France, these kind of things. And so in all of this work, I've always tried to keep a focus on the geometric side of data sciences, primarily because you know, I'm a geometer, that's how I see things. So what do I mean by that? Well, if we take a big step back uh, and try to make a diagram of how people work with machine learning in real life, I think you can identify three main steps. So first we have domain specific observations on a population of and patients. So usually, you know, we, we like to think of our data sets as spreadsheets, uh, table, Excel tables with N rows, uh, D columns, and those D columns, well, they, they are just domain specific. So you can work with MRI or CT 3D images. That's where I come from. You can work with, with cognitive scores, with physiological measurements, like, you know, blood samples or drug consumption history, like we have now. Uh, through the healthcare system. Then using those end patients, uh, using this data, typically you construct either explicitly or implicitly uh, an end by end matrix of similarities. You know, that allows you to encode a notion of neighborhood uh, of proximity between samples that you think is relevant to your real life machine learning problem. And then once you have distilled your information about your data set in this matrix of similarities, you plug this in a general machine learning method that is suited to the problem that you want to solve. So usually, you know, you, you think about 
clustering tasks with k-means that take as input a distance matrix, classification, like hierarchical classification, uh, regression that takes as input something like kernel matrix, or visualization, you know, things like UMAP or TISNI take as input a k-nearest neighbor's graph. And my research really is about understanding this part of the pipeline, about understanding similarity structures. You know, first, what are the implicit priors that they reflect? So what does it mean to take a cross entropy or an optimal transport distance or a Manhattan distance, you know, to encode your data, to work with your data? And second, how can you manipulate those matrices efficiently? Like what are the similarities that are that can scale up to very large data sets. So that's really what I'm interested in. And this field of, let's say, data science from a geometric perspective is moving really fast. You know, our target is to allow scientists and doctors to work with tailor-made models as efficiently as possible. And what we've seen over the last decade is the advent of graphics processing units. You know, I'm sure that you've used them already. So basically, uh, farms of thousands of cores uh, that you can buy for very cheap, you know, if you buy them from NVIDIA. And so on paper, uh, the, those new AI accelerators, those hardware chips, they provide incredible value for money. So for about a thousand euros, you can buy a thousand cores or 10,000 cores now, which give you on the order of a teraflop, teraflop, so basically a thousand billion operations on floating point numbers per second. So that, that looks fantastic on paper, but the main downside is that when you work with that many cores in parallel, you have huge bottlenecks that are related to memory usage, to memory layers, especially the registers, you know, the, the smallest buff memory buffers that are located close to the compute cores and that uh, overfill very quickly. So in real life, basically writing a truly original program on a GPU is very hard. And it's out of reach for most scientists because you know you, you want to you, you don't have time to be both an excellent statistician to understand medical data and at the same time be a CUDA guru, a C guru to, to write those kind of, of things. And so that's why over the last decade, you know, we've seen the the machine learning community progressively consolidate around a user-friendly Python ecosystem with high-level frameworks like Fiano, Cafe, and then TensorFlow, PyTorch, and JAX that are uh, consolidated around a small number of key operations. You know, if you look at those libraries uh, from an outside perspective, you quickly realize that they are very convenient. Uh, I'm sure you know because you have this transparent GPU support uh, with uh, from a Python interface with automatic differentiation, but you only have a handful of operations that are truly well optimized. Basically, what is really well optimized is what you need to implement a convolutional neural networks or a transformer architecture. So you have excellent implementations for uh, convolutions on grids, like 2D and 3D images. You have excellent implementations for matrix matrix multiplications. You have really good implementations of the Fourier transform. But not much more than that, actually. You know, if you compare uh, what is provided out of the box by PyTorch versus uh, what people can do, you know, by writing hand uh, handwritten CUDA code, uh, you realize that okay, for other types of applications, uh, vanilla PyTorch, DAX, or TensorFlow implementations are really suboptimal very quickly for graphs and and many other things. So this. This has created a bit of a of a delay of a dilemma uh, for people, because uh, most scientists uh, today have the choice between either implementing something using PyTorch, so something that looks like a convolutional neural networks, or uh, trying to implement other algorithmic uh, architectures uh, that are going to be less well supported. Okay, and so in this context, my project uh, has been a long-term investment in the foundations of a field by trying to expand the standard toolbox in data sciences to deal with the challenges of the healthcare industry. So basically I try to develop software extensions for PyTorch primarily, that is a development of advanced models, you know, things that are not necessarily convolutional neural networks, 
without compromising on user friendliness and numerical performance. And so today, I want to quickly show you uh, what we can do today uh, on symbolic matrices. And by symbolic matrices, I mean distance kernel matrices. Uh, then recent progress is in optimal transport, which is really generalized sorting algorithms in dimension two, three, five, ten. 10. And finally, discuss a little bit, you know, the long road from those kind of research libraries towards standardization and genuine clinical impact uh, in hospitals. So first, let's talk a bit about symbolic matrices and try to be clear about what I mean here. So as you know, certainly, computing libraries represent most objects as tensors. You know, so that's obvious when you look at the name of TensorFlow, but this idea has been around since the days of MATLAB for Tran. And that's a great thing because it allows people to express the, the, their, their toolbox that, I mean, the toolbox that we learn in engineering classes very easily, you know, on a computer. So on the one side, this focus on tensor is great, but on the other side, it also, um, it's also suboptimal uh, for many tasks from a computational perspective. And why? That's primarily due to the constrained memory accesses that we deal with on the GPU. So first, uh, there's an issue, which is that on the GPU, um, for a compute core, uh, accessing, uh, not necessarily the registers, but accessing the main memory, you know, the memory of your GPU, where you have check bytes of storage space, takes a lot of time. You know, like for a compute core, uh, making a memory access takes as much time as something like 100 arithmetic operations. So it means that if you define in your PyTorch program, a very large arrays, then your red, your run times are going to be affected. You know because you're going to have to move around those big memory buffers from your main GPU memory to the compute units and do back and forth. Okay, so this is why in practice uh, most scientific programs are bound not by the number of arithmetic operations but by the number of uh, memory accesses that they make. So that's an issue which is that, for instance, uh, manipulating very large distance matrices on the, on the GPU is very cumbersome. And so, and so on the other hand, you also have an issue, which is that GPUs are hardwired hard to make contiguous memory accesses, you know, to, to access memory by contiguous blocks of hundreds or thousands of coefficients at a time. And this is great if, you, if you're working with 2D images or 3D images, but this really penalizes the use of sparse matrices. You know, because when you deal with sparse matrices, usually you have like, you, when you implement a, a matrix matrix product with a sparse matrix, you need to make random memory accesses, you know, at random locations that are given to you by the locations of your non-zero coefficients. And that can be quickly very slow. So in practice, for instance, with PyTorch, if you try to implement things with sparse matrices, you're, you're, you're not going to get speed ups uh, if you have more than like 1% non-zero coefficients in your sparse matrix. So this means that, okay, uh, this is very limiting. So today, in order to reach optimal run times, most, research have, most researchers have to make a choice. You know, either you restrict yourself to operations that are supported by the constructors. So convolutions, fast Fourier transform, these kind of things. So this is what most people do. Or you can decide to develop new routines from scratch in C++ CUDA that support exactly the type of program that you need for your applications. So some people do this, like uh, you, you can look at very influential papers like FICE for nearest name of search or KPConf for uh, geometric deep learning. So usually those papers are really well appreciated by the community, but uh, this takes several months of work, you know, uh, several months of really grueling low level development and you know, most people don't have time or expertise or taste for this. So that's a bit of a problem. And so seeing this with colleagues, we decided to create a, a new library, which is KeyOps, uh, the KeyOps library that provides very efficient support for symbolic matrices. And by symbolic matrices, I mean matrices that may be very, very large, but whose coefficients are really given by a relatively small mathematical formula that is evaluated on relatively small data arrays. 
So think, for instance, of a distance matrix. Okay, if you have 1 million points xi, 1 million points yj, you may want to store your distance matrix as a huge uh, array with 1 million rows, 1 million columns, but this is going to be very inefficient. It's actually much more computationally clever to encode this object as given by your data array. So like 1 million rows and three or five columns for your points xi, uh, the, more or less the same size as the point yj, and a small program okay, that, that you're going to evaluate on the fly whenever users want to access uh, the coefficients of the matrix. So that's distance matrices, but you can apply the same idea to kernel matrices and numerous transforms, like for instance, a non-uniform Fourier transform uh, corresponds to a formula, which is a complex exponential. Okay, and so KeyOps really provides efficient support for this abstraction for all matrices that fits uh, this template. So it's available online uh, at this address as an extension for PyTorch, NumPy, MATLAB, and R that supports both CPUs and GPUs. So it's, it integrates transparently with automatic differentiation engines. And under the hood, it relies on the just-in-time compilation of very optimized C++ schemes that are triggered for every new reduction that you could apply on this matrix. So like every time you want to perform a matrix vector product with a matrix like this, for instance, you're going to trigger uh, the compilation of, a, of an optimized binary. So the orders of magnitude to keep in mind is that if the formula F that defines your matrix is simple, and by simple, I mean less than 100 arithmetic operations, then you should expect to work with a matrix that has 100,000 rows and 100,000 columns in 10 to 100 milliseconds. And you should expect to work with a matrix that has 1 million rows and 1 million columns in 1 to 10 seconds. So this looks very fast, but if you think about it, this is just the hardware ceiling of a thousand billions operations per second that you buy when you buy a GPU, you know, because a matrix with one million rows, one million columns has around a thousand billions coefficients. So you should expect to be able to work with it in about a second. And that's really fast. Uh, and typically one to two orders of magnitude faster than what you would get with standard GPU implementation like PyTorch TensorFlow for a wide range of problems. So to be clear, uh, let me show you how you would implement a very efficient nearest neighbor search in dimension 50 uh, using KeyOps, so this library as an extension for PyTorch. So I don't know if you use PyTorch or JAX or TensorFlow or NumPy on a daily basis, but this is just standard PyTorch code to create large data arrays on the GPU. So here I import PyTorch and I decide to create an array with 1 million rows and 50 columns on the GPU. So CUDA means that I send my data on the GPU and I do the same thing for the points YJ. So uh, 1 million rows, 50 columns. And I use this uh, broadcast dimension trick. You know, I say that XI is an array of size 1 million, 150, and YJ is, a diamond, is an array of size 1, 1 million, 50, you know, to, to create those dummy dimensions so that Python understands that if I write x minus y, I really want to compute all the pairwise differences between the points x, i, z, and y, j. So the thing is that if I write just now x minus y, I'm going to get an out of memory error because uh, the, the computer cannot store uh, a 1 million by 1 million by 50 array on the, on, on the, in memory. So instead, what I do here, is that I turn my dense arrays into symbolic matrices. So I import a new type of matrix uh, from the PyKeops uh, package, which is called lazy tensor. And I wrap my arrays X and Y as symbolic tensors, X, I, and Y, J. And then once I have like, entered the realm of symbolic objects, I can write X, I minus Y, J without throwing out of memory errors. So here I can simply use any formula that I like to define a 1 million by 1 million 
symbolic matrix of square distances. So here I write xi minus yj squared and I sum with respect to the, dim to the trailing dimension 50. Okay, so PyTorch here understands that this is a symbolic object. And then if I want to retrieve uh, a real PyTorch tensor, like if I want to retrieve uh, a dense array, I just have to try to perform a reduction on this big uh, matrix. So for instance, I can perform an arg mean reduction along the rows of my distance matrix to retrieve, uh, to perform a nearest neighbor query. Okay, so I can write that indices i, it's dij dot argmin along the rows of the, of the matrix, and I retrieve a standard torch tensor. Okay, so as you can see, this is fairly transparent, you know, using Keops. I just had to use this custom tensor type at the start of my program. And what's, it, what's really important about Keops is that it combines performance with flexibility. Okay, in terms of row performance, the script of the previous slide that I show you implements a very efficient nearest neighbor query, which is on par uh, with the handcrafted brute force CUDA scheme uh, of the FICE library, you know, which is supported by Facebook. But unlike those handcrafted C++ scheme, it can be used with any metric. So I showed you code to perform a nearest neighbor query with a Euclidean metric, but I could also use an L1 Manhattan metric just by typing xi minus xj dot absolute value and then take x sum. I can use cosine similarity metric, hyperbolic metric, more or less anything you like, really. So Keops supports many features, so arbitrary formulas and variables with essentially all the reductions that we use in machine learning, like sum, log sum x, k-min, matrix vector products, many operations, so mathematical things, but also neural networks. And for like power users, uh, advanced schemes like batch processing, block sparsity, these kind of things, all of this being fully integrated with the automatic differentiation engine of PyTorch. So in terms of runtimes, okay, this is the main graphic to, to have in mind. Okay, I show you here the benchmark of the Gaussian convolutions between clouds of N 3D points on a typical gaming GPU. So what I mean is that I draw N points at random in dimension three, then I create a symbolic distance matrix, then I apply a Gaussian function so I turn my distance matrix into a kernel, a Gaussian kernel matrix, and then I perform a matrix vector product with this symbolic uh, Gaussian, uh, with, the, with the symbolic uh, Gaussian kernel matrix. Okay, and I'm showing to you runtimes when the number of points n ranges from 100 to 1 million, and with runtimes that range from a fraction of a milliseconds to 10 seconds. So this is a log log plot. So what you see on, on, the, on the green curve is uh, a typical NumPy CPU implementation. So you see first that this is quadratic runtime, like brute force, which means that if I multiply the number of points by 10, I multiply the runtimes by 100. So this is a slope that we get. And you see that you can work with NumPy with 1,000 points. But as soon as you try to work with 10,000 samples, you know, you start to have to wait for several seconds at a time. So the main selling point of PyTorch is that it provides a GPU backend for everything that NumPy does. Uh, and so you can implement the same thing as NumPy with, on the GPU with PyTorch and you get a massive speed up by basically two or three orders of magnitude. So this is a performance curve with PyTorch, which is kind of fine if you have uh, around 10,000 points, but if you want to go beyond 10,000 points, you quickly run into out of memory errors and runtime issues. And so this is where Keops is really interesting because with Keops first, you can scale up to arbitrarily large data sets without memory errors. And you, you, you're also significantly faster uh, than PyTorch. You know, typically you, you gain an order of magnitude speed up on those kind of tasks. So as you see, we, we can really process 1 million points in about a second. So now what about applications? You know, I'm going to, to go fast, just to be clear. This was really the important part of the talk. So first, Keops is, I think, as you can immediately see, is a good fit for machine learning research. You know, it's very easy using Keops to implement standard machine learning programs like k-means or Gaussian mixture models with any kernel metric or formula that you like. 
You can also perform spectral analysis, UMAP, this kind of thing. So I think a core application for the library is everything that's related to cridging, uh, spline, Gaussian processes, kernel regressions. You know, this is a standard tool in machine learning and statistics that you may have seen, you know, that's what that's what's behind all those plots where you have training samples and you want to find an interpolating curve uh, through the training samples with confidence intervals outside of your training data set. And under the hood, all of those methods, all of those plots, they rely on the inversion of a linear system where the matrix that you want to invert is a kernel matrix. You know, so you under the hood, you always try to solve a system of the form lambda times identity plus a kernel matrix times A equals to B. So you want to perform this computation really efficiently. And so what we did is to make sure that KIOPS can be interfaced really transparently with the standard solvers in the field, like SciPy or GPyTorch. So for instance, this is a benchmark uh, that was done by the people who developed GPyTorch on the on a typical data set, like with uh, 300,000 points in dimension three. Okay, and basically before using KIOPS with GPyTorch, so with state-of-the-art solvers, you could solve Gaussian process regression problems in about seven hours with eight GPUs, you know, for this type of data set. And so then just by changing the backend for matrix vector multiplications to KIOPS, they were able to perform the same task in 15 minutes with one GPU. So on the one hand, basically switching to a really optimal backend for kernel computations allows you to work with this type of data on uh, affordable hardware. And on the other hand, it, allowed, it also allows people who have access to large clusters to scale up to even larger data. So that's how KIOPS has been used by our colleagues who are really focused on Gaussian processes is that they typically use KIOPS now to scale up kernel methods to billions of points efficiently. So that's very nice. And okay, so that's one thing. And personally, you know, things that I did in London and that I still do now is to use uh, this library, not just to do mathematical like method, but also to do geometric deep learning. Okay, the context here is that people are really interested in developing trainable models on non-Euclidean domains, like point clouds, surfaces, graphs, you know, beyond 2D and 3D grids. And the big challenge is that even though there is growing interest for this type of problem in the industry, these models still lack support on the numerical side. You know, for, for genuine graphs, it's generally well supported now, but for point clouds, it's still not ideal. You know, C++ and CUDA is often required to reach top performance. And that's where Kiops is really useful because now with a few lines of Python, we can implement really fast local interactions with scan your neighbors interactions. But we can also implement global interactions, you know, on point clouds uh, using generalized convolutions. Right? You know, this is the type of thing that I did on protein surfaces like quasi geodesic convolutions, this kind of thing. And so that's really the spirit of all of this work is that we try to provide tools that enhance the modeling freedom of people who work in biology, uh, medicine, to enable people to inject as much domain specific prior as they believe is required. Okay, so that's, that's really uh, the main thing. And then another project, uh, basically a, a type of uh, computation that I really focused on and try to enhance is optimal transport. Okay, and optimal transport is what generalizes sorting to spaces of dimension uh, d larger than one. And what I mean by that is that let, let's consider two point clouds, you know, A, so X1, Xn, and B, so Y1, Yn, that are two clouds of n points in Rd. And I define the optimal transport distance between A and B as uh, a least square, uh, um, a square Euclidean distance between the Xi's and the Yj's up to permutation of the yj's. Okay, so optimal transport is uh, square Euclidean distance up to permutation. And what's remarkable about this problem, you know, this combinatorial optimization problem, is that when you apply it to point clouds in dimension one, so for instance, x1, x5, y3, y1, 
you, re you realize that the optimal permutation is going to be an increasing mapping between the points. So for instance, here, the optimal matching is the one that sends x1 onto y3 and x5 onto y1. So that's pretty remarkable because it, it basically we have retrieved the notion of increasing mapping without using the notion of ordering on the real line. We, we're, we're just using the metric structure of the space. Okay, and so that's that's how uh, that's why we say that it's a very neat mathematical way of defining sorting, which is obviously a, a, an important operation to arbitrary metric spaces. Okay, and so it's optimal transport has two main uses in data sciences. So first, the optimal matching itself is useful in many applied fields. You can understand it as a nearest neighbor projection that is subject to a bijectivity constraint. So that's really useful in 3D shape analysis and in operations research. And also the total cost, so the, the value of this distance, which is also known as the earth movers distance or the Wasserstein distance, is very useful uh, distance between probability distribution that allows people to define nice geodesics between like Gaussian distributions or kind of barycentric interpolations between segmentation maps. Uh, data sets, these kind of things. So basically, optimal solving the optimal transport problem has been a topic of interest in applied math uh, for since at least the 1940s. And today, you know, especially after a very active decade of work in, in this uh, in this field, we have access to very fast multi-scale algorithms on the GPU that you can understand as generalized quick sort algorithms. You know. And so the progresses of the last decade, they really add up to a significant acceleration compared with, let's say, the, the vanilla baseline synchron solver on the GPU. So basically, if you use Kiops, if you use an annealing, annealing strategy and maybe multi-scale things, the current run times, you know, that are state of the art, if you want to solve an optimal transport problem on a modern gaming GPU, is that you should expect to be able to solve an optimal transport matching between 10,000 points in 30 to 50 milliseconds and between 100,000 points in a fraction of a second. You know, all of this, assuming that you have a fairly modern GPU and that you have installed this package, you know, uh, this Geomless library that I developed where we package the really, really fast solvers. So as a conclusion, you know, I think the key points that hopefully you, 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 you could uh, you could take home uh, from this talk first is that symbolic matrices are to geometric machine learning what sparse matrices are to graph processing. You know, so that's really a very fundamental idea which has been around for long, but th that has only become effective uh, over, the last over the last five years thanks to uh, massive advances around compilers. You know, the, the compiler uh, field in computer science has really made impressive progress over the last five years. And this is what has allowed us to develop KIOPS, you know, this library that uh, allows you to work effectively with symbolic matrices. And so now that okay, you know about this, you can expect very significant speed up in a wide range of settings compared to PyTorch, TensorFlow, or Jack baselines. And so the second main idea is that optimal transport, you know, people have discussed it a lot uh, over the last five years, but really I think from a programmatic perspective, this is generalized sorting. So it provides simple registration for point clouds that are close to each other. And especially in small dimension, like if you work in dimension two, three, five, you can expect super fast log linear solvers. Okay, in, in higher dimension, it's going to be quadratic with a good constant. So most importantly, I think that those tools, uh, they, they are here to open new paths for geometers and statisticians, you know, allow people to study other models, uh, not just always focus on convolutional neural networks and transformers. So the message is that GPUs are way more versatile than people usually think, and that there is ongoing work all around the world in academic labs to provide fast GPU backends for research, you know, going beyond what Google and Facebook are ready to pay for explicitly uh, through uh, TensorFlow and PyTorch. So, 
you know, it's also maybe it, it can be interesting for you, especially if you're doing your PhD. Uh, you know, that I, I think the talk that I presented to you, it's an example of a long-term investment that is really starting to bear fruits. I think that this investment in low-level computational uh, uh, libraries has led to two major evolutions in the community. So first, the threshold for what we consider a big geometric problem has gone up from 10,000 points to 1 million points. Basically, the heuristic now is that if you have less than 100,000 points, you should be able to work brute force. You don't have to be very clever. You can implement things brute force using PIOPS. It's going to be fun. And the second thing is that optimal transport more and more uh, is understood as a simple object. You know, maybe 10 years ago, it was still a bit uh, impressive, worrying. We didn't know how to compute it effectively. Now we understand that it's very cheap, it's very affordable. And that's really, I think, because as a community, uh, we have uh, you know, uh, made the work to invest in those numerical foundations that now allow us to work on deep learning, clinical things. So all of this, obviously, I couldn't do it alone. So I want to stress that this is really genuine teamwork with colleagues, mostly in France, like Alain Trouvé, my three colleagues for Optimal Transport, or my two colleagues on the KIOPS library, but also you know, really nice PhD students uh, in Switzerland and in the US for all my work on geometric deep learning. So going forward, you know, I, you know, I want to stress that we're still a long way away from genuine clinical impact, which is what I'm really interested in. I think as of today, early 2023, these tools that I presented to you, they are starting to diffuse well in our research communities. You know, KeyOps, for instance, it has been downloaded maybe 400,000 times. Uh, and germ loss, like the optimal transport thing, more than 60,000 times. So that's basically mostly PhD students, really. And the target now is to go beyond those expert users to try to reach the people who actually do uh, medical research. So the first step in March 2022 was to remove all the problematic dependencies from KeyOps. And so that's what KeyOps 2.0 is about. And now it's much easier to install than what it, than even me, than basically in very early 2022. And now we are working on mostly quality of life improvements. So high performance on CPU, because many people don't have access to a GPU. So I think it's important to also give them as uh, runtime that are as efficient as possible. An API that should be 100% transparent with NumPy, because that's important too. And then you know, working on standard benchmarks for kernel of methods and optimal transport and real applications. You know, I, I've worked a lot in 2022 on applications to drug consumption data from the French uh, national insurance system. Uh, and so I hope that in, in years to come, we'll have very nice results to show you, you know, in real geometric data analysis applied on like 60, 70 million time series from, from the French healthcare system. So if you're interested in everything I told you uh, today, uh, documentation, tutorials, and videos are available online. So first you can visit the website of the Kelps library, but you can also check. So this is my PhD thesis, which I hope is really accessible. And uh, last semester, I taught a class on geometric data analysis in Paris. So it's available here with like full, uh, full presentations, videos, and everything. So, you know, I hope that I wasn't too long. Uh, and thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, obviously, I'd be happy to answer. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. This is great. And uh, wow, uh, so any any question from here? Uh, yeah, yeah, one question. So in so if you're using like time series data, it means that you would have symbolic matrices uh, with two tensors that are composed of this uh, time series. But this time series can be of quite a long range, and you still have memory issue in this case, no? Because so, you have two tensors, so it's both of the tensor your um, story are already of large dimension. How are you planning to solve this problem? I don't know if this is a simple question. I, 
Yes, yes, yes. So, so you mean yeah, what happens if is if both things are uh, high dimensional, then uh, it's a big issue. So that, that's uh, that's uh, yeah. but, but that's a general problem uh, I would say in uh, in, uh, in GPU computing at, at the moment is that you know the, the main thing to the main number to have in mind is that the size of the registers, so the smallest, fastest access memory buffers on a GPU. You have enough storage space for a hundred float numbers uh, per core. So really, the idea is that if basically, if you look at PIOPS, uh, if your variables xi and yj, their size is smaller than one hundred float numbers, you're good. It's going to be really fast. And if you go beyond that, it's extremely hard. Uh, basically, you, you run into uh, register speeding, etc. And so, to give you an idea of the kind of what is happening today uh, around this problem, so we decided that we could not handle uh, this issue. Okay, <laughs> like you, you have to prioritize things. So we decided to focus ex ex exclusively on a low dimensional uh, problem. But for instance, in natural language processing, you really need uh, high dimensional embeddings uh, to represent words, you know, and semantic meanings. And so this is why over the last two, three years, there has been massive uh, investments, uh, you know, around transformers, et cetera, in uh, degraded numerical types. So, you know, so what happens today is that people try to add support for um, like float 16 numbers, these kind of things that could allow you, you know, to pack more dimension in the same storage space. You know? So that's what's happening today. Who knows what's going to happen? You know, for my own work in time series, uh, basically, yeah, I do, I, I do not compute uh, n by n matrices between time series, but it's more like I use key ops to compute time varying uh, features, time varying covariates along time series. So that's mm -hmm. where we are now. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. So it is a. Uh... This actually is super useful, and uh, because our, I mean, I say this is a bit of a, a very interested question in the sense that uh, my own group, or well, there are many members here, uh, we build um, say tools uh, in Python uh, and MATLAB, by the way, but it's also mostly Python now uh, for I mean for various things, mostly uh, probabilistic inference. We and uh, so far, we've been using stuff in, uh, in NumPy uh, for the simple reason that we, so the, the problem is the users in the sense that, well, not probably it's the user, but let's say in the sense that we want to reach a very broad audience. Yes. And sometimes already you say, I know that, you know, PyTorch seems like, okay, everybody's using PyTorch, but still let's say, sometimes, you know, you have an audience, for example, of uh, scientists who are not machine learners, and let's say, you know, they want to analyze their data. And so let's say asking them to install, let's say, some non-standard package that requires them to do some, you know, complicated installation procedure might, you know, be too complex. So for now, for example, you know, we're just using a you know, standard NumPy. So you just, we just say, okay, you install Anaconda, uh, you know, whatever, and then, you know, you, you can use our, our, our method. Um, so <laughs> I found super interesting that, let's say, for example, that, you know, we're mentioning that, let's say, for the ZikiOps 2.0, you were trying, you know, to make, to reach people with CPUs, et cetera. Yes. So the, What's your so you think let's say that KeyOps will be compatible essentially for also for uh, tools that then you know are used by let's say quote unquote let's say not advanced users? Yes, yes, yes. That's really the target. And the thing is that we are benefiting from uh, a general industry wide uh, evolution. You know, basically five years ago, few people had a compiler installed on their machine. But the thing is that just in time compilation, you know, which is really what is behind PyTorch, uh, which is behind uh, KeyOps and the latest release of PyTorch, has become so important uh, for even for video games. Uh, you know, because I know if you know the, about shaders in video games, but now you know it has become more and more complex. It has become so important that nowadays, very efficient compilers are bundled within the drivers. For instance, so. Now, now, if you have an, uh, an NVIDIA, uh, mm. an NVIDIA uh, GPU and you use an NVIDIA driver, then you have uh, an extremely efficient just-in-time compiler, which is already installed. Uh, right. And this is why uh, 
this is why you, we can you, you can hope that uh, the barrier of entry is going to be uh, lower and lower, you know, primarily because more and more useful things are coming prepackaged on users' machines. So that's the thing. So the, the big thing between Kiops 1.0 and Kiops 2.0 is that Kiops 1.0 we relied on like GCC, uh, NVCC compiler. Uh, so like a real, basically you needed like development packages. Yeah, exactly. And Kiops 2.0, what happens is that it's purely Python that generates a C++ file. And then we send the C++ file to the NVIDIA driver. And mm -hmm. the NVIDIA driver automatically uh, gives you back uh, um, uh, 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 an optimal an optimized binary and so it means that we could remove from the dependency stack you know everything related to cmake you know all of those very very naughty dependencies that's so, super yeah. interesting <laughs> so we're well, actually i think i find it super interesting so i'd say i'm definitely something that you know i'm interested in so i'll, uh, I'll be following these developments and uh we might get in touch at some point <laughs> yes no if you have questions i'll be happy to to answer really. And so, you know, as I told you, my main uh, focus really is on doctors and uh, pharm pharmaceutical, uh, mm -hmm. uh, like the Department for Health in France, for instance. And so, where we are now is that, you know, we, we develop packages, uh, all packages that under the hood rely on Kiops, rely on PyTorch, that mimic, that mimic exactly. Uh, the API that people are used to. So, for instance, I don't know if you use the survival R package, you know, for like no. Cox. So it's basically it's the very common model for for people who work with drugs. It's like the Cox proportional hazards model, and people they all use the R survival package. And so what we've done this year is to re-implement the R survival package, uh, but with a GPU backend. And so at the moment, very, very few people in hospitals have access to a GPU, yeah. you know, and so our plan is not to hope that they are going to use it this year, but what we do is we, we, we put forward this package that telling people, if you have a GPU, it's going to work, you know, you don't have to change your analysis scripts, nothing, it's going to work, it's going to be 1000 times faster, and so the hope is that the next time that they have funding for uh, to buy new computers, they yeah. think, oh, you know, maybe buy yeah. a workstation with a GPU. And so the yeah. hope is that in yeah. five years, people are going to uh, to use those tools more. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I mean, that, that's, uh, that's really, really interesting, really good. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I think we are running out of time. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I said this, is, uh, this has been uh, super helpful and interesting. And uh, we have something to <laughs> to download and uh, and play around with. And th thanks also, yeah, for, uh, for you know for the great presentation. Super, I found it uh, very clear and very much the point. Uh, so yeah, uh, thanks again thank for, for being here. Yeah. Thank you. Very and bye. Bye, bye. Thanks. Bye bye.